The Advaita Vedanta tradition, when it's not conflated with this tradition that I'm talking about, teaches that the world is an illusion. There is no world. And if you think there's a world, you've made the same sort of cognitive error as when you see a rope in, in, in the road way up ahead. And you think it's a snake and you get closer and you see, oh no, it's actually a rope. Whereas according to this tradition, consciousness is innately dynamic, which is a big philosophical difference. The implications of this difference were actually considerable. People practicing Vedanta were renunciates, renounce the world because it's not real. Whereas uh, people practicing this non-dual Tantra were non-renunciates. They did not renounce anything because there's no need to because the world is a real form of the one consciousness and deserves our engagement. The following are some excerpts from a series of discussions that we do with Bernardo and guests about twice a year. And we were lucky enough to get Christopher Wallace along to the final session of this most recent one. Christopher is a highly regarded scholar and practitioner of Kashmiri Shaivism which is a non-dual tradition from ancient India with remarkable similarities to Bernardo's take on metaphysical idealism, which is the notion that the fundamental substrate of all reality is consciousness. We discuss free will, whether the world is illusion, time, what meditation can reveal, and how we can balance reason and logic with direct experience. If you want to take part in the next conversation or have questions for Bernardo and Christopher, we're holding another session this coming March, 2024, and you can find us at adventuresinawareness.com. Great to be here with all of you. And uh, I'll admit to being slightly nervous, which I never am as a rule by as a, as a speaker, because I'm a huge admirer of Bernardo's work. Thank you for all the writing that you've done. And the reason I'm a huge admirer is because uh, Bernardo's work explicates with a, a thorough um, scientific rigor the exact same view, as far as I can tell, uh, that the masters and philosophers and sages that I study uh, wrote about a thousand years ago in the Sanskrit language. So it's really amazing to me to see uh, somebody explicate this same view with a, a scientific thoroughness and fill in a lot of the gaps, as it were, that couldn't have been filled in uh, by people writing a thousand years ago, not having the modern scientific tools and, and technologies uh, that we do now. So I made a little slideshow, just a little slideshow. Uh, I know Bernardo likes slideshows, so <laughs> I thought I'd make one. So thank you for inviting me. And the tradition I study uh, goes by several names, but uh, we can call it by the usual name, non-dual Shaiva Tantra. And it flourished especially between the 9th and 11th century. And most of the great writing of this tradition happened in the Kashmir Valley. And for that reason, it's also known as Kashmir Shaivism, but it wasn't limited to the Kashmir Valley. In fact, this body of work influenced all of the Indian subcontinent for many, many centuries and reached all the way down to the Southern tip of India. Here, of course, you see a satellite map of the subcontinent. And here in the far north is the Valley of Kashmir, which is a beautiful place, by the way. Um, of course, today it's a Muslim place. Uh, but a thousand years ago, uh, the religion of Shaivism, the religion of the deity Shiva, flourished there. And these um, intellectuals that were... Um, patronized by the royal court there, wrote voluminously on this uh, non-dual view that I'll explain a little bit about, and which seems to be more or less identical to uh, analytic idealism. So briefly, non-dual Shaiva Tantra articulated a robust philosophical view that we may call idealist, anti-materialist monism, 
And I just like that name because it gives us the acronym I am, which is a bit fun, uh, but also known as a consciousness only view, which in Buddhism is called a mind only view, where those two terms are being used interchangeably. So this view was uh, supported by three pillars, logical argumentation, mystical or spiritual experience, and scriptural revelation. And I won't say more about that now, but just so you know, that's the traditional uh, epistemological uh, tripod <laughs> of this, of this uh, uh, tradition. And this tradition analyzed the process of cognition into 12 phases represented in this image by the 12 gold circles, each phase being worshipped as an aspect of the tantric goddess Kali. Uh, so this is a fascinating aspect of the tradition that they were interested in all the subtle nuances of cognition, uh, cognition referring to any cognitive experience, of course, concept or percept. Um, and they meditated in order to not entirely transcend thought, but rather to become aware of all the subtle nuances that are involved in the process of cognition. Yeah. So here's just a visual example of what some writing from back then looks like. Uh, this is Sanskrit language written in the Sharada script on a piece of birch bark. Uh, most of India used palm leaves, but in Kashmir, you get birch bark uh, as the medium <laughs> for the writing. Um, and ink made from lamp black, that is to say the soot uh, of, of a lamp mixed with a certain oil. And so just to kind of take you back to a thousand years ago and give a hint of how astonishing it is that these folks were writing about these things uh, at that time of virtually no technology as we understand it. So anyway, they had three primary textual registers, meaning they, they wrote in three different ways, three very different literary genres, we could say. One was the genre of uh, philosophical argumentation. And some people in the West don't even know that there was a tradition of rigorous philosophical argumentation in India, that Indian spiritual literature wasn't all woolly, woo-woo, airy-fairy, that actually there was a rigorous uh, philosophical tradition of argument, and um, that that argument had a specific uh, uh, logic that it followed that was established over centuries. But the second uh, uh, textual register they used was, was poetry, was a poetic evocation of the truths they sought to demonstrate through the philosophical arguments. And then thirdly, they authored practical manuals, and these are manuals of meditation and yogic practice, uh, practices aimed at direct non-conceptual realization of what had been conceptually explained uh, and poetically evoked in the other two primary registers of text. So they believed, and I believe it's possible through meditative practice to have a direct uh, non-conceptual experience, meaning to say not mediated by um, thought forms of what we're talking about here. And we can come back to that. So what's the view of, of these folks in a nutshell who, who wrote in Kashmir a thousand years ago? It's hard to put in a nutshell, but this is my, my attempt. Um, there's only one consciousness, one being, whose body is the entire universe of phenomena that all sentient beings experience in total, and whose soul, as it were, is awareness. And they did acknowledge that this is a metaphor. They didn't uh, intend that we take it literally. And so I noted the image here is metaphorical. This is an image of Shiva as the universe, but it's metaphorical in the sense that these sophisticated authors did not believe that the one infinite consciousness, which Bernardo calls mind at large, 
could be um, anthropomorphized in any literal sense. That is to say, they said this one universal consciousness is not a person the way we understand personhood. In fact, personhood is a mental construct of human culture, not a thing in itself. And so the one consciousness that encompasses and subsumes the entire universe of phenomena uh, cannot be considered a person, even though it can be considered, in a sense, a being. Uh, so therefore, they resorted to this metaphorical language, this, this one being has uh, the universe for its body and awareness for its soul. So what is the status of us, of, 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 of human entities? Well, in reality, according to this view, uh, there is no plurality of agents. There, there are individuals, but they are not separate agents because there is only one all-encompassing agency, uh, the agency of the singular consciousness, which instantiates as the universe of experience. And all individuated sentient beings are contracted embodiments of the one being. So they use this word uh, uh, contraction, right? That, that, that these individual sentient beings such as you and I are contracted embodiments of the one being and thus are microcosms of the whole. That is to say each uh, sentient being um, whether human or if there's aliens, then they would be the same in terms of uh, each sentient being is a microcosm of the whole meaning in some mysterious way. The pattern of the whole is contained within every part in the same sort of way that each cell of our physical body contains the DNA of the whole body. So each sentient being is like a cell of the universe. Of course, they didn't have that metaphor back then, but they tried really hard <laughs> to, 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 to reach in that direction, uh, not having that metaphor. Um, furthermore, just a couple more points, um, which as far as I know, correspond to um, analytic idealism. The world is real, not illusory. Advaita Vedanta says it's an illusion. Right. It's a it's a it's a mistake to think anything has manifested. And this view says, no, the world is real, not illusory. It is a real transformation of consciousness, uh, even though it's nothing but consciousness. And it arises with the appearance of pattern and structure. It's not random. It's not uh, a pure chaos. It is a highly patterned, uh, though there can be a little bit of randomness involved as well. Uh, furthermore, space, time, and form are modes of the self-expression of consciousness, but they are not absolute or fundamental, whereas consciousness is. So consciousness is the a priori, not space, time, and form. Okay, so that's um, a brief overview. And now I, I just want to give a little bit more um, nuance, a little bit more detail by reading a page from my first book. And this explains the view of the tradition that I'm talking about in more exact uh, detail. And it's just one page, so shouldn't take too long. All that exists throughout all time and beyond is one infinite divine consciousness, free and blissful, which projects within the field of its awareness a vast multiplicity of apparently differentiated subjects and objects. Each object an actualization of a timeless potentiality inherent in the light of consciousness, and each subject the same, plus a contracted locus of self-awareness. This creation, a divine play, meaning it's done for its own sake, not for any other reason, is the result of the natural impulse within consciousness to express the totality of its self-knowledge in action. 
or rather to say the totality of its um, sense of its own potentiality in action. The unbounded light of consciousness contracts into finite embodied loci of awareness out of its own free will. So will is, is, is primary here in much the same way as it is in Schopenhauer's philosophy. When those finite subjects then identify with the limited and circumscribed cognitions and circumstances that make up this phase of their existence, instead of identifying with the trans-individual overarching pulsation of pure awareness that is their true nature, they experience what they call suffering. To rectify this, some feel an inner urge to take up the path of spiritual wisdom and yogic practice, the purpose of which is to undermine their misidentification and directly reveal within the immediacy of awareness the fact that the divine powers of consciousness, bliss, willing, knowing, and acting comprise the totality of individual experience as well, thereby triggering a recognition that one's real identity is that of the highest divinity, the one consciousness. This experiential insight is to be repeated and reinforced through various means until it becomes the non-conceptual ground of every moment of experience. And then one's contracted sense of self and sense of separation from the whole is finally annihilated in the incandescent radiance of the complete expansion into perfect wholeness. Then one's perception fully encompasses the reality of a universe dancing ecstatically in the animation of its completely perfect divinity. So that's my attempt at a more detailed nutshell of this particular tradition. And it does draw on specific phrases in the Sanskrit literature um, uh, authored by some of these great masters, most of which, unfortunately, is not translated into English because it's not easy to translate. Uh, and it, there is more and more and more being published in translation right now, because as it happens uh, right now is something of a renaissance for the study of this tradition. And there's a lot of scholars involved with uh, getting these works translated. And just a, 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 a verbal footnote, somebody said, uh, uh, why use the adjective divine? Why does he use that adjective? Well, it's, it's not me, it's the tradition itself uses the adjective divine. Um, but why use that adjective? For two reasons. One, because it connotes um, the boundlessness of consciousness, that consciousness in its real nature is not constrained in any of the ways that our experience appears to be constrained. That is to say, when consciousness manifests, it manifests uh, according to what we call the laws of physics, um, of its own free will, as it were. That is to say, consciousness manifests in a patterned way, in a highly patterned way, and that pattern is what we describe using the laws of physics, but it is not in its real nature necessarily constrained by any of those factors. In fact, it, it, it can and does and will manifest uh, as countless other universes in an infinity of time, um, which may have different laws of physics as well. So it's divine in the sense that it is um, boundless and, and infinite and unconstrained in a way that our uh, uh, cognitive minds can hardly imagine, right? But it is, but it is again, not a person. It's not a divine person. So it's not to be uh, conflated with or reduced to the Western theological notions of divinity, uh, in any way. But also the, the word divine attempts to point to the fact that um, the universe in this understanding is not cold, dead, inert matter, but rather suffused with beingness, 
that it that the that the universe is being. Uh, and if you want to say a being, you, you could, but that runs the risk of of that um, personification, right? Better perhaps to say beingness. Um, so, and as I already briefly mentioned, uh, the Advaita Vedanta tradition, when it's not conflated with this tradition that I'm talking about, um, teaches that the world is an illusion. It's a kind of cognitive error. There is no world, in fact. And and if you think there's a world, you've you've made the same sort of cognitive error as when you see a rope in, in, in the road way up ahead and you think it's a snake, which actually does happen in India, by the way. <laughs> um, and you think it's a snake and you get closer and you see, oh no, it's actually a rope. And in the same way, according to Vedanta, you think it's there's a universe, but there isn't. Nothing has ever manifested. Consciousness is utterly quiescent. It doesn't do anything according to classical Vedanta. Whereas according to this tradition that I study for many years now, um, consciousness is innately dynamic, which is a big philosophical difference. Consciousness is innately dynamic and actually transforms itself into the substance of experience, that is to say, into the universe, even though it never emits anything externally, meaning to say um, the universe is not external to the one mind, mind at large, or the one consciousness. It's internal, <laughs> of course, but, um, but it is external from the point of view of, of any of the contracted embodied forms uh, of consciousness, what Bernardo calls dissociated alters. Um, so so the, the the implications of this difference were actually considerable because people practicing Vedanta were renunciates by and large. They were renunciates, renounce the world because it's not real. Whereas uh, people practicing this non-dual tantra were non-renunciates. They did not renounce anything uh, because there's no need to, because the world is a real form of the one consciousness and deserves our engagement. And that's the primary uh, difference there. So having said that, um, I'm I'm happy to um, hear uh, any any questions uh, Bernardo has um, and and just transition into dialogue phase here. No questions, it's clear. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, do, you, do you have any questions for uh, Bernardo, Christopher? There's lots of questions coming in and there's some questions from before. Well, Bernardo, you, you talk about um, the metaphor of the whirlpool. I was reading your book, Why Materialism is, is Baloney. And I, I think you've updated your view in various ways from the time of that book. But I think you still think that the whirlpool metaphor is um, is a valid one. And I do, too. Um, so when you speak of a boundary between the individual and the external world, that to, in, to some degree is a figure of, of speech or else it's a highly permeable boundary, right? Because um, like the whirlpool can receive uh, uh, currents or, 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 or currents of information, we could say, from other whirlpools and from and from mind at large, there's there's no hard boundary to speak of. Um, I, I hope I'm understanding you right, because certainly in the in the, this tradition that I study, um the 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 individual is a is a localization of consciousness with a unique vantage point but no hard boundary can be drawn meaning to say um there's 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 no uh there's nothing to 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 hang the the our personal attachment to being a unique individual on um, in a sense, according to this tradition. So, so in fact, this tradition agrees with the Buddhist version of no self in many ways, not exactly, but it very closely agrees with the Buddhist version of no self, um, which doesn't deny that there's a unique vantage point of consciousness associated with each apparent individual. 
but uh, but that but all other constructions of, of self are 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 thought constructs, and that um, what everything that we would call me, like the body, the mind, is completely permeable and constantly exchanging information with its total environment and is made of its environment. Is is that in accord with your view? Yes, there is no. Uh, no fundamental boundary between the personal self and the world. Um, metaphors are used for always up to a certain point, and beyond that point, they break. In the case of the whirlpool metaphor, it is useful to make clear that uh, the boundary one is talking about here is not like a wall, because there is no wall between the whirlpool and the rest of the river. Actually, there is no separation between the whirlpool and the rest of the river. The whirlpool is just an action that the river performs. It's a doing of the river, not something apart from the river. That's why you can't pick up the whirlpool and carry it home with you, leaving the river behind. And yet we can, in a sense, speak of boundaries. You can delineate the so-called boundaries of the whirlpool. The whirlpool is not as big as, as, as the river. There is a point where we can say the whirlpool ends here, and from this point on, it's the rest of the river. It's not a hard boundary, but it's a boundary in a sense, and it is an identifiable uh, one. We could speak of an epiphenomenal boundary, uh, if you wish. More technically, if we go beyond the metaphor of whirlpools, and we speak more te technically in terms of dissociation, even dissociative processes don't have ha hard walls or hard boundaries between them and the rest of the mind which they inhabit. Um, what you have is a an abstract line of inferential isolation. It's when certain mental contents cannot infer other mental contents through some form of cognitive association because they are inferentially isolated from those other cognitive contents. There is nothing but cognitive contents in one mind. There is nothing other than cognitive contents that could, that could constitute a fundamental wall to separate them. They are not separated by anything other than mental contents. Uh, they just cannot inferentially reach one another. Uh, so we can speak of a boundary in that sense, not in the sense of a, of a wall. Or, or anything fundamental, or anything that is distinct from that which becomes seemingly separated by such boundary. Yeah, exactly. But I I talk about that in terms of vantage point. There's the simple fact that um, from any given vantage point, some things can be seen that can't be seen from another vantage point. And I argue that uh, my ability to see the door of my house from my vantage point that you can't see is not fundamentally distinct from my ability to see my own thoughts, but not see your thoughts, that it's a matter of a vantage point rather than of, of boundary in any strict sense of the word. I think differences in vantage point alone are not sufficient to account for the fact that uh, I can't read your thoughts and presumably you can't read mine and I don't know what's happening in China right now because each of your eyes has a unique vantage point. You see the world differently from each of your eyes. Um, and yet, there isn't a seemingly separate consciousness associated with your right eye and another one associated with your left eye. Uh, there is only one mind that uh, sees the world through two concurrent, non-dissociated vantage points. Your mind merges the vantage points of your two eyes, leading to 3D vision. Um, so you have there two different vantage points. They are different. If you put your finger in front of your eye and you look with the left eye and then look with the right eye, you see it differently. You see one side of the finger in one case, the other side of the finger in the other case. So these are two vantage points, but there is no boundary between them. And that's why there isn't two people claiming to see the world from their own vantage points when it comes to your two eyes. There aren't two um, mental complexes that seem to be separated. I think you need something more beyond just multiple vantage points. You do need some kind of inferential isolation that can be then 
talked about as a boundary in some sense, though not a fundamental boundary. Yeah. Uh, th maybe this takes us in a slightly different direction, but um, isn't there some evidence to suggest that uh, there are, in a way, two different cognitive vantage points associated with a human in terms of the, the left and right hemispheres of the brain? We have that evidence of, of people who've undergone the split brain surgery um, where, where one one hand is sort of fighting with the other hand about whether to take the cookie or or which shirt to wear um or and there's other experiments that that seem to indicate um that our experience of being a a, a unitary consciousness if we were able to drill down to a deeper deeper level that uh, that that experience is emergent from from some kind of um cooperative multiplicity what what do you think about that if you sever the corpus callosum, then you are inducing the creation of a boundary. And then you may have two truly dissociated complexes, but under ordinary circumstances, a healthy human being does not have two visual complexes experiencing the world through dissociated points of view, even though we do have separate points of view, one associated with each eye, there is no boundary between them. And yes, if you sever the corpus callosum, then you will create a boundary between them. But I don't think that changes the point that uh, two points of view in and of themselves are not enough to create the illusion of separation. Um, yes, if you sever the corpus callosum, you will do that because you will impose a dissociative boundary if you do that. Um, of course, we as individuals we have multiple psychic complexes. Uh, most of the times we don't notice that. We think we are the ego. Um, but there is a lot more going on in the human mind than just the ego complex. Over 100 years of depth psychology say that. But then that means we also have internal dissociative boundaries. Um, for evolutionary reasons, the, the mental processes corresponding to autonomous functions like uh, kidney and liver function um, there is no evolutionary advantage for the metacognitive ego to have explicit explicit control over those mental processes because these are functions that need to be performed at all times. They don't require deliberation, decision-making. No, you always have to filter your blood. So your kidney and your liver should always work. So those mental processes that correspond to kidney and liver are naturally dissociated from the ego complex. Because if you had to deliberately perform kidney and, 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 and liver function all the time, your attention would have to be drawn to it. And if you would become distracted, you would get blood poisoning. So it's much more effective from an evolutionary perspective to create these internal dissociative boundaries, mini whirlpools within the big whirlpool, um, because it's functional uh, to do that. But in all cases, I think we can. There is still a sense in which we can speak of boundaries, even though not fundamental boundaries. I think. Yeah, absolutely. That that makes sense. Now, somebody uh, requested if if we could discuss free will, which which I certainly have things to say about. But do you think that would take us down a a pointless rabbit hole, or are you interested in that? <laughs> Topic. Uh, uh, it will probably do so, but it may still be interesting to go through the process. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the very phrase free will is is problematic when people have an idea of what they think that means. And that's that's uh, can undermine the conversation from the get go. Um, but basically, from from the tradition I study, uh, the understanding is like this. Uh, there, there's no such thing as personal free will or individual free will because there's no such thing as person except as a mental construct. What there is is an organism, a body-mind organism, and that body-mind organism is spontaneously doing whatever it does. It's 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 carrying out its genetic programming and and its psychological programming, um, and. And what we do is we tell a story after the fact, um, an egoic story, I did this, or I chose that, 
and it's uh, and it's a story told immediately after the fact um, that that makes sense only when that thought is unreflectively believed. You you just assume <laughs> the thought to be true, and therefore it seems to be true. Um, but at the same time, this this tradition says um, that that mind at large or the one consciousness is, as it were, nothing but free will. <laughs> that is to say, um, it 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 freely manifests a universe of experience with its full range of possibilities um, because it sort of metaphorically wants to experience. Uh, that full range of possibilities. And here we run into problems with language because um, wanting from the human point of view, it, it, most people, you think of something that might be possible and then you want it. It's preceded by some sort of cognition of a possibility. But here, according to the to this traditional view on the universal consciousness, it, there's there's not a, a kind of thought and then a decision to to act on that thought. But nonetheless, will will is involved at will in a very fundamental precognitive sense that the one consciousness um, uh, wills a universe of experience into being with the range of possibilities that this universe has, and perhaps other universes have other ranges of possibility, um, and 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 that 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 is free and willed, <laughs> but it's the individual organism. Um, uh, insofar as it takes itself to be a separate person, a ghost in the machine, something somehow outside of the the, the causality that governs everything else, that uh, imagined person uh, doesn't have free will precisely because a thought cannot have will. It's just a thought. Uh, w what do you think about that way of saying it? I think extensive personal free will requires a person to truly exist as an entity and it is not an entity separate from its environment so personal free will is a very precarious concept and uh, to begin with you know where is that this distinct entity that we are talking about it's like saying that the whirlpool has free will well the whirlpool is is just a, a name that we give to a particular behavior of the river. It's not a thing. So it cannot have free will because it's not there to begin with. It's an identifiable pattern of behavior that you can delineate, but it's not a separate entity with uh, an agency of its own. Uh, in the same way, I think people are like whirlpools. There is nothing to people but nature. People are doings of nature. People are something nature is doing, not an agent separate from nature that can in turn define its own actions because that agent is itself a doing. So how can it be free to do beyond the thing that does it? <laughs> it exactly. It, it can't. Um, exactly. But I think the, the red herring of free will go even beyond, beyond that. Even if we... Even if we you know, get rid of this, this illusion of separateness and we understand that people are not separate entities but uh, doings of nature, actions of nature. And we say, okay, the only thing that truly exists is nature as a whole. Even then, to speak of free will is, is it creates a, a semantic distinction that has no correspondence in reality, um, specifically. Um, when we say that we choose out of our will, what we are trying to do is to contrast that with choosing out of necessity. So if, if there is a necessity for me to choose as I do, then I'm not free to choose. I'm only free to choose if I can choose in spite of and contrary to whatever necessities obtain, whatever necessities are the case in nature. But if the entity we are talking about is nature as a whole and there is nothing outside of it, then whatever it chooses is determined by what it is. And then the difference between will and necessity completely disappears. What nature must do is what it necessitates to do because it is what it is and not something else. 
But that necessity expresses itself subjectively, qualitatively, as the irresistible will to do what is necessitated. In other words, the expression of the necessity is the will. And the will is the necessity. There is no distinction between the two. What nature does is what it must do. And what it must do is what it irresistibly wants to do. The wanting is the necessity. The necessity is the wanting. So the whole discussion about free will it loses its semantic grounding because it's founded on this semantic distinction between necessity and will when this distinction is illogical. There is no space for, his, for this distinction. So even to speak of universal free will, well, it's free in relation to what? The universe is the sum total of everything that is the case. Um, whatever the universe is, what it does is a function of what it, it is. Um, yeah. So the necessity is what it wills because the universe is the universe is qualitative in essence. And the will is the necessity. Totally agree. Totally agree. And this is the same view. Um, it, it's just that... Uh, you know, and this maybe gets too too um, spiritual, but when when people ask uh, in the context of this tradition I'm talking from, why is there something rather than nothing? The answer is will, the the inherent will of the one consciousness, and that of course is not necessarily a satisfying answer for for some people, but otherwise it's exactly as you said. Um, but this this kind of other element is introduced of 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 bliss or joy that that the one consciousness joyfully does or wants to do exactly what is necessary what is necessitated by uh the the constitution of its own being which which of course is is the totality of of the universe yeah i think the word will is appropriate. It's just when we say free will that we are creating a semantic distinction that has no ground uh, in reality. Right. But the, world, the word will is appropriate, like Schopenhauer used it. Because, you see, it, it, we can model nature as one field of subjectivity, and we can model experience as the different patterns of excitation of this one field, just like different ripples and whirlpools are different patterns of excitation of the lake. There is nothing to ripples and whirlpool but the lake, in the same way that there is nothing to uh, experience but this one field of subjectivity. There is only the one field of subjectivity. So multiplicity, uh, multiplicity arises out of the different possible patterns of excitation of that unitary thing, the one field of subjectivity. Now, you could say, what is it that provides an impetus to that field to self-excite? to move, to vibrate, to behave in some way, as opposed to staying at absolute rest, like a lake without ripples. Well, you could call that impetus the will, the inherent will of that field of subjectivity. It inherently desires something in some sense. And it is that power of will that leads to its own self-excitations and therefore to the phantasmagoria of uh, of existence, to the plethora of uh, varied experiences that constitute uh, what is. So to speak of will is good. It's the moment we talk about free will that we incur in 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 some semantic issues, uh, because you know, free in relation to what? It's the will of the one thing that exists. So in what yeah. sense can we uh, can we justify an extra qualifier and say that it's free i mean it, if there yeah. were something beyond nature then nature could be constrained by the by the necessities of this something else but we define nature as the sum total of what is of what is so there is nothing external to it to impose anything so the qualifier free becomes unnecessary and confusing um, but will isn't. Will is fine. Will is the impetus for the excitations, I think. Yeah, beautifully said. And uh, we get some of the same terminology in this tradition, um, even even this, this word excitation, to talk about how uh, nothing becomes something. In other words, consciousness in its 
potential form, unmanifest, uh, pure potential becoming phenomena. They describe it with that Sanskrit equivalent of the word excitation. So that's yeah, that's, yeah. That's if, really if cool. it, in, I think it matches perfectly under analytic idealism. It is conceivable that this field of subjectivity could exist at least temporarily, um, if time has any bearing on this. It's conceivable that it could exist it exist in a state of absolute rest and no excitations. And since experiences are the excitations, a state of absolute rest would entail no experience, only the potential for experience. And that is the definition of nothingness. When there is no experience anywhere in nature, then there is nothing in the sense of no thing because the potential for experience remains there. And that potential for experience is, of course, something in some sense. Now, there is a difference between there being the potential and there not being even the potential. So there is something in some sense, but there is no thing in the sense of there being no experience in a state of uh, absolute rest. And yeah. then the whole discussion about why there is nothing in terms of something that disappears as well, because the nothing is the pure potential and the something is the excited potential because of the, the will compelling that excitement. Yeah, and it's possible with deep meditative practice to have this subjective experience that what it very much seems like is entering into the pure potential of, of absolute consciousness because one enters into this state or stateless state where there's no, no phenomena, no cognition, no thought, no feeling, no sensation, but there's still awareness. And it's, and it's of course, awareness of nothing. And people imagine that as, as um, a black void, but that would be something. And it's just awareness. And it seems to be <laughs> an experience of this uh, this pure potentiality of of consciousness prior to uh, the the manifestation of phenomena, and that's why the tra this tradition says that that always is that even though there's all this manifestation uh, and excitation, actually the 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 state of um, absolute still silent spacious openness devoid of phenomena is also ontologically true <laughs> um and of course it's not something you can know for sure but you can have this subjective experience that seems to be an experience of exactly that and in that mode it's also timeless there's no time and space uh either which is part of why they argued that time and space are are constructs or or they're they're entailed by phenomenal experience but not at this deeper level i agree time and, and, and space are are emergent epiphenomena they are they are imposed by our cognition not by the reality that is out there but i think we have to be careful in how we use the concepts here to avoid uh, contradiction one cannot experience the lack of experience because experiencing that lack means that there is no lack. You are already experiencing something, you see? Um, so a, a state of absolute rest in this one field of subjectivity underlying our nature is not, a, is not a state one could talk about or describe, even, in, even tentatively, because it's not a state that can be experienced. By definition, it's a state in which experience is not there. Um, so I agree that you can't you can't talk about it, but it, 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 the experience is 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 one of awareness experiencing itself empty of content. And so maybe what you're experiencing is the potentiality for content. Well, if we define content or experience as an excitation, then you cannot experience the lack of excitation because that would mean that there is no experience. It's a matter of how we define and use the terminology uh, in order to, to make sense of the direct experience people report in a way that is conceptually and internally consistent. In other words, I'm not questioning the reality you are describing. Um, I, I'm questioning how best 
to describe it conceptually in a way that is self-consistent. If we define experience as an excitation, then we cannot experience a lack of excitation because otherwise there would be an excitation, <laughs> which is the experience of it. Um, yeah. What may well, be fact, going on? Now that you mention it, uh, um, the the greatest author, the greatest writer of this uh, literature, of this tradition does specifically say that in that state of apparently nothing, no phenomena, no cognition, there is still what he calls this extremely subtle pulsation or extremely subtle excitation, which accounts for um, the experience that we're that we're calling awareness experiencing itself empty of content. But he specifically says, uh, as you said, that the, there's this very, very subtle bit of, of excitation, or he calls it undulation. Yeah, uh, I was having a discussion with Swami Pravapyananda, I think. Pravapyananda. Pravapyananda uh, from New York. And he, he, he put it beautifully. He said, um, um, the void is not the lack of experience it is the experience of the lack you know, it, it it's not an absence of experience it's an experience of absence and and i thought that that, that yeah. put it brilliantly um we have a metaphor from technology that fits very well with what you just said this pulsation it fits beautifully with it actually surprisingly well which is the metaphor of um radio carrier waves um, when you are sitting in your car and tune in to a radio station it has a certain frequency say 98 megahertz 102 megahertz that frequency is a pulsation it's literally what frequency means frequency means a pulsation of a certain speed that's what frequency is the faster the pulsation the higher the frequency and each radio station has a certain pulsation what is the radio program that you then hear when you tune into a radio station? Well, those are modulations of the pulsation. So a pulsation would be something like this, a perfect sinusoid. Mm. The programming of the radio station is some oscillation on top of that sinusoid. You know, higher frequencies on top of this pulsation. Um, the void may be when you experience the unmodulated carrier wave. When you tune into a radio station with no programming, there is still a pulsation for you to tune into, but it doesn't have voices, it doesn't have music. So that could be a, a way to model what's going on. Maybe what we refer to as empty awareness, empty consciousness, is awareness that has only the carrier wave, that intrinsic fundamental pulsation that is always there, that is intrinsic to nature, it can't be removed. And in Indian music, that is symbolically represented as the drone. That yeah. yeah, the background, and then which is yeah. modulated by the other instruments. Yeah, or the shruti uh, uh, note. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, as I reflect on the experience, uh, we, we call it the void, and yet it has these qualities. They're not really uh, describable. Um, but it, it it somehow has a quality like vastness. Uh, it somehow has a quality like um, awesomeness <laughs> that it's just utterly, utterly um, dwarfs uh, one's normal experience of 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 oneself in an incomprehensible way, and and words completely fail. And yet, uh, you know something like vastness not something like tiny enclosedness you know so it does it is it has these very subtle qualities that yeah might might be as you say um pertain to to the to the fundamental wave form in this metaphor in relation to our ordinary state of consciousness so dissociated and confined i can easily imagine that if you can dip your toes in the waters of undissociated consciousness, then in relation to our ordinary consciousness, that will come across as vast and awesome. Yeah. I don't think it is intrinsically vast and awesome. I think it is just what it is. But in relation to what we are used to right now, 
it will be experienced as vast and awesome because we are so confined by a little narrative of personal self as if we were a thing, an entity that really existed as opposed to a, a transitory doing of nature. When we are confronted with what is actually going on, then in relation to the delusion, what is actually going on is vast and awesome, sure. <laughs> yeah, yes, I absolutely. So I, I have a question for you about time. Uh, let's see if there's agreement here, because before you referred to evolutionary biology, uh, which, of course, is, is a narrative based on very good data. It's a very good <laughs> narrative based on good data um, about what, what's happened over time. And from the perspective of, of the tradition that I study, um, time, as we already said, is not absolute. And indeed, when we talk about history or development or evolution or anything like that, we are employing a mental model to account for the patterned way in which phenomena appear to us in the now that the now is so highly and deeply and subtly patterned with many sort of <laughs> levels to it uh, of patterning that to to make sense of it you know these narratives like and it's not it's not to say that evolution is is wrong of course in any way it's just to say that um that uh it, we don't need to posit that that time is ultimately real that the past exists or the future exists we can just say this is the most useful uh, mental model for making sense of the of the patterning that that appears in our experience now. What, what what would you say to that? Nobody has ever experienced the flow of time, right? Um, we experience something that we misunderstanding as a flow, but we never experience the flow. At any one moment, we only exist in the present. Everything we experience is in the present. Even our memories are experienced in the present. Our expectations about the future are experienced in the present. Um, and the past only exists insofar as those memories experienced now. And the future only exists insofar as those expectations that are experienced now. As a matter of fact, I was in a conference Essential Foundation organized uh, this week, Time and Mind, and physicist Paul Davies um, he, he repeated something that I think most people forget, and it's very important, which is that uh, we could be so-called, we could be, um, uh, between quotes, time traveling all the time, and we wouldn't have a clue. Because if we try, if we time traveled to a day when we were five years old, if we truly time travel to that point in time, then we will only have the memories we had then. We cannot carry the memories of the future with us to the past. Otherwise, we are not really going back to the past. We are just going across timelines, progressing towards our future. And it will just be that our future will look like our past. <laughs> but we are not really traveling in time. To yeah. really travel in time, you have to reconstitute the entire state as it was then. In other words, you would think you're just a five-year-old kid with the memories you had when you were a five-year-old kid. Five year old kid. Same thing yeah. about traveling to the future. If you truly travel to the future, to the time when you will be 86 years old, you will have the memories you will have when you're 86 years old. So you will not think that you time traveled at all. You think you just lived your life and you arrived naturally at that point. So nature is constituted of a set of experiential snapshots that are cognitively associated with one another. And nothing is actually flowing in time. Nothing. All right. we ever experience is a particular time shot that exists in its completion in a framework outside time and space, a, a framework wherein all structure is constituted of cognitive associations, things that relate to one another through links of meaning and not through cause and effect in time. Because and that's why the, time. these movies where people uh, switch bodies, I mean, that's obviously nonsense, <laughs> right? Because, uh, you know, if, if you and I switch bodies right now, we wouldn't even know, right? You're looking through the, 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 the brain organism. Consciousness is looking through the organism that has the memories it has. And therefore, you have the experience of, of having lived 
this life all the way up to this moment, because this moment as constituted in the now has the character of these impressions uh, from an apparent past. Yeah. And and, and look, to, to paraphrase Paul Ellis again, the physicist, uh, um, his presentation is still very much in my mind. Um, he, he made a point that is crucial. We only think there is a flow of time because we mistakenly think of ourselves as unchanging entities, as these immutable, real, separate entities. If we think of ourselves as unchanging entities, fixed, then the world flows in front of us, and there seems to be a flow of time. But yeah. to be consistent with the delusion of time, then you have to say, well, we change too. If you want to grant reality to the illusion of time, then you have to be consistent with that and apply that to what we are. We are no longer our five-year-old selves. Not a single atom that was in our body then has remained in our body since then. Some may have left and returned, but they, they have all moved around like the water in a whirlpool. Uh, not a, you know, Our thoughts are different, our political opinions are different, our fantasies and dreams are different, our desires and wishes and fears are different, our clothes are different, we look completely different. What is this fixed perspective, point of view, that see, watches the flow of time? It's, it's not fixed. It's flowing with everything else and then there is no relative movement if two things flow together then nothing's flowing if two cars maintain their distance on the highway they are not moving in relation to one another they are only moving in relation to the highway now take away the highway take away everything else in the universe and just leave empty space now those two cars not only are not moving with respect to one another they are not moving period so the moment you remove all fixed perspectives, uh, namely the delusion of a fixed personal self, is the moment you realize there's nothing flowing here. There is only a grand tree of cognitive contents associated or not with one another through the evocation of common meanings. That's all there yeah. is, there ever was, and there ever will be. And, and that's why it's perfectly true. It's not some mystical thing, but it's perfectly true to say that, uh, to, to each of you and myself, you have never gone anywhere, right? What you've experienced is your uh, your environment, that is to say, the phenomena that constitute the conscious, uh, con the contents of consciousness in an apparent flux when you reflect on the, uh, the, the apparent reality of past, present, future, meaning to say you've got the impression that the environment around you looked different at some other moment. That impression exists now, right? But even in the now, we've got, we've got, you know, we've got this happening or whatever, but like, I hope it makes sense what I'm saying that, that, that you've literally never gone anywhere. It's just the contents of consciousness have transformed. And we uh, uh, just colloquially speak of that as I, I went here and I and I went there uh, in, in, in space and time. Yes, uh, it, there is no grounds, uh, even physically. Paul Davis is a physicist for the notion of a flow of time. Paul Davis still insists that something that can be called time is there because it's a dimension of extension that allows us to organize our data about the world. We, you can speak of time in that way, but it's not then what we normally think of when we use the word time, because in ordinary usage, the word time is indelibly associated with flow. And in Paul Davis' view, this flow is not there at all. Um, and I think there is substantial reasoning, substantial reason in physics, both empirical and theoretical, to part with this idea of the flowing time. It, it's it's not there. It's, it's just not there. Yeah. You know, and things it, it, like uh, delayed choice experiments make it empirically very complicated to believe in it. And even theoretical reasoning makes it very complicated in uh, complicated believing in it. Yeah, yeah, and and someone in the in the chat window said something about um, 
you know, if you if you experience absence, isn't there still a subtle duality? So so I wanted to to ask about that too, because um from from my point of view, uh duality itself is a mental construct, meaning to say, um, it seems that there's a hearer and a herd, a seer and a scene, but that seeming is itself an artifact of language, right? So we we, we take ourselves to be a, a seer, seeing a separate object, and there's the subject-object dichotomy, but that subject-object dichotomy can collapse in, in, in meditative awareness, whereby there's no seer and seen, there's only seeing, there's no hearer and heard, there's only hearing. And, and so the sense of, of being a subject perceiving a separate object completely vanishes. And, and, and so that's part of why we, we invoke this term non-duality. There's a number of reasons to, to invoke the term. Um, but I don't know if that's if that a aspect of things is something that that analytic idealism gets into at all. The moment you model the whole of nature, the diversity of nature, as just different patterns of excitation of one underlying field, duality is gone. There is ever but only the field. You know, there are no ripples separate from the lake, no whirlpools separate from the lake. There is only the lake. There is nothing to the ripple but the lake in movement. Um, so analytic idealism is fundamentally non-dual um, in the sense that it says there is just one field of subjectivity. Everything else are just particular behaviors or patterns of excitation of the field. What we consider to be an external subject is a pattern of excitation of the field. What we consider to be us is a pattern of excitation of the field. And these patterns of excitation can interfere, just like ripples can on a lake. They can flow towards one another and, and impact one another and then interfere constructively or destructively. Yes, this can happen in mind as well. Different patterns of excitation can interact. We call it causality. Um, but all along, there is only ever just the lake that ripples, not anything other than the lake, not anything other than that field of subjectivity. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. This is all brilliant, both of you. Thank you so much. Can, can I drop in a question which I think will speak to many of the questions that have come in in the chat, which is uh, really a question of epistemology of how we're deciding what is true and what's not. So obviously, Christopher, you've come from this tradition and you mentioned they've got the three pillars, which is the scriptural, um, which I guess is revelation, the meditative experience and philosophy. And Bernardo, you've restricted your, if I've understood, uh, well, you've mentioned some use of psychedelics, but predominantly you've um, worked through the philosophical lens. Yeah. To, um, to what extent would contradictions or new information from either, when they contradict or could appear to contradict? So I'll give you a super simple example. I was just watching a lecture, um, and this was shared in, in the chat, and many people watched it as well with Ian McGilchrist, where you contemporarily uh, inhibit the left or the right side of the brain. And if you inhibit the left side, things that normally seem inanimate seem to be full of life, like the sun. Um, and then if you inhibit the other, in the other direction, even people see everything just seems to be atoms or whatever. So those are, in a way, experiences that you can induce very easily and can probably turn up in psychedelics and meditation as well. Should the, And another one interesting to what you were both just speaking to, if you inhibit the right side, just through the left lens, experience just shows up as discrete moments and all sense of flow disappears. But personally, I would hesitate, you know, people mentioned before I was a dancer, you know, to completely annihilate this whole concept, because I know that I experience flow. It is part of my experience. And to call that a discrete, there's something there that's like, okay, which, where are we looking for truth? And, and I suppose it's a very long rambling question, but maybe starting with Bernardo, since from your perspective, these ancient masters got so much right, from your perspective, if they were to say, oh, by the way, rocks also are alive and they have a consciousness, would you start to take that more seriously? I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'll move my model a little, little bit more in that direction because somehow they got all the rest of this so correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think 
it's critical here that we understand the limitations of language in, in describing what is essentially ineffable states. Um, does the sage or the prophet, does he mean what you think he means when he uses those words? If you read I Am That by Nizargadatta Maharaj, which is somewhere here behind me, he contradicts himself about five or six times per page. So these contradictions express the limitations of language and discourse. So we have to be careful in taking the word said for the, men, for, for the meaning that the sage meant to communicate um, and to sort the two and, and, and see behind or beyond words, you cannot quote single sentences. You have to absorb the body of work of that person and, and, and try to occupy that person's perspective in the palace of mind. Um, Jung has been accused of contradicting himself left and right all the time. But if you absorb the corpus of Jung's work, you see what is the underlying intended meaning and that it's not contradictory at all. It's just the words chosen depending on context, depending on references, depending on the person he was talking to that create this illusion um, of contradiction. The same can be said about Schopenhauer. So that's the first observation here, the first note of caution. The other one is how you begun your question, which is which of these two avenues, reason and evidence on the one on the one hand and introspective inside of or on the other, when they seem to contradict one another, what do we make of it? Well, first line of commentary is both get it wrong sometimes. I know uh, um, um, psychedelic heads that come back from a trip being absolutely sure that um, they physically were in a blue planet talking to the aliens from the planes. That's how they interpret that experience, the uh, introspective experience they have just had. Does that invalidate the reality of that experience? No, but the, the experience can be interpreted wrongly. What you make of the experience can go far off target. And humans are known for doing that especially people who just dip their toes into those deep waters without having develop, developed uh, discipline in order to be able to interpret it with some more reliability because the mind has this tendency to deceive itself. And people working on the basis of reason and evidence get things wrong most of the times. Just look at the amount of disagreement in the worlds of analytic philosophy and science right now. Most people are wrong. Whatever the truth is, most people, if not all, are wrong. So we get things wrong. Both sides can get it wrong. So it's, it's impossible to say, well, the introspective side is the one who should go, or the reasoning side is the one who should go to. No, both are uh, uh, um, uh, not immune to failure. And finally, and this, this will wrap up my comment, sometimes both are right, but they seem to contradict one another. And that has to do with false dichotomies. And the examples you, you just uh, uh, mentioned in your question can very easily be examples of false dichotomies. Um, there is something that we describe as the flow of time. We don't experience the world as a collection of static photographs uh, distributed over a table. And yet, we don't experience the flow of time because we only ever experience the present. So we are we create a false dichotomy here. Um, the same thing about things being alive. Um, the, the ontic essence or the dynamic force that underlies people and rocks is the same. It's that underlying field of subjectivity. And then because we are part of it, and that's how we experience ourselves, we attribute life to it, even though life is just a dissociation. And then we are correct in saying that the rock is alive. What we mean by it is that its substance, the substance behind the rock, is the same substance behind us. It's that one field of subjectivity. Yet we are dissociated complexes and the rock's not. 
So it's not contradictory to say, on the one hand, the rock seems that it's not alive. It's not. It's not a, it's not a dissociative uh, a complex. And say the rock is alive. Yes, it is, in the sense that the dynamic force and essence behind it is the same dynamic force and essence behind life. It's infused by consciousness. It's infused by the river underlying the whirlpool. The rock is a ripple. Life it, it is a whirlpool. Both are made of water and the dynamics and, and the, 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 the energy of the water. So yeah. it's important also not to, to, to let false dichotomies force us into choices we don't need to make. If you illuminate a cylinder from the side, you see a rectangle uh, as a shadow. If you illuminate it from the top, you see a circle as a shadow. They are not a dichotomy. Both the rectangle and the circle are right. They are both shadows projected by the cylinder. The, 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 yeah. the artistry of life here is to take a point of view from which you realize that the circle and the rectangle are one and the same thing. Totally agree. Uh, I, completely. <laughs> this is why modern culture and social media is so problematic. You know, people extract one little piece of someone's discourse, which it it it, it, it can only be understood truly uh, as a whole. You know, as as you said, and and agree with all the other points <laughs> you made. And I just want to circle back to something Amir said because he said I I experience flow. But we want to distinguish here between flow and the flow of time, meaning to say when we when we say you don't experience the flow of time, that just means that um, you, you didn't experience a flow from the past you remember to a now to the future you anticipate. But you can experience flow in the now. Right. We, we were talking about dance before Bernardo came on at the beginning it, when you're when you're dancing and 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 you stop thinking about it right <laughs> when you when you go into flow state in the sense of um what uh cheek sent mahai wrote about that's real right <laughs> it's real it, it, it's, it's it's a flow in, in the now um but that, that that doesn't establish that there's any kind of flow from the the remembered past to now to the imagined future so just to distinguish those those things and, and maybe that makes it more clear yeah maybe if i can try to elaborate even a little more in case it's, it helps people there is obviously something we are very tempted to describe as the flow of time we are not denying that something what we are denying is that it is what it seems to be in other words flow nothing is flowing but there is something that seems to be a flow of time, but that something exists only now. What we call the flow of time exists in the now. It's a property, a characteristic of the experience of the present moment. In other words, it's there, it exists, but it's not flowing. It's, it's a characteristic of the now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Beautiful. And... Uh, I actually need to go soon, but I just wanted to say uh, one more thing, and this is this has been amazing, and I hope we do more of it. Um, but uh, you know, a, a while ago in the chat window, uh, uh, Ricky was saying about um, if the present moment is like one frame in a movie, do the other frames still somehow exist, even if we don't have access to them? Um, and I, I want to mention <laughs> that it's very much possible to have this experience, and many people have, um, whereby the present moment is not a tiny, tiny slice of time between a vast past and a vast future, but rather the present moment is incredibly full, full to overflowing, and, and somehow in some incomprehensible way includes past and future. That, that all past is now and all future is is now insofar as they're real. And so when you experience in that way, it's a much deeper and more profound experience than than the than the than the total insignificance that would attach to experiencing just one tiny microsecond of of an infinite universe. And and that also leads me to mention um that 
you know, for, for those who are interested, and, and some of you already do have a meditative practice, but for those who are interested, it's all it's possible to experience in a very visceral, tangible way, um the beingness, I would call it the beingness of mind at large or the one consciousness. And uh, the way I would describe it, even though it's indescribable, is a, is a sense of subtle presence pervading absolutely everything. Um, that, and, and, and the presence is what I am, but it's much greater than what I think I am. And, and the presence, the beingness, is, is very much alive, but not, of course, in the sense that the rock has its own point of view. I completely agree with Bernardo about that. <laughs> it's not panpsychism. Uh, the rock doesn't have an inner life. But yet, it's possible to experience this kind of beautiful, subtle um, beingness pervading all phenomena whatsoever, including the, the, the inanimate phenomena. And that's a very beautiful experience. And of course, I like to think, <laughs> I want to think that it has to do with sensing, tasting a little bit of mind at large and and not just a a, a, a weird psychological artifact of, of of a human brain totally with you uh, there i don't know if you have more time i could i could try yeah to... yeah I have, I have two more a couple more minutes <laughs> i i i try to get across some of what you said in um, in an older book from 2016 called um, um more than allegory. Um, when we say only the present exists, we are not disinvesting the past and the future. We are not saying that they are in some way non-existent or lesser than the present. Because what we call past and the future are aspects of the present. So they are identical to the present in essence and nature the past are a certain class of experiences we have in the present we call them memories the future is a class of experiences we have in the present we call them expectations they are two aspects of the present perceptual experience is the missing aspect and our current thoughts and fantasies and feelings and emotions and another aspect so the past and the future are not worse than the present. They are of the same nature and of the same ontic significance as the present because they are aspects of the present. And the present is not this tiny little thing between past and future. The present is the sum total of the whole of nature. Um, and one exercise to see this, the, the only way to see this is to understand that extinction is an illusion. Extinction in time or space is an illusion. So one way to do that is to try to be consistent within the illusion and see where it leads you. So according to the illusion, the present is now and last hour or yesterday is the past and the next hour and, and next week are the future. But it's not only last hour or yesterday, it's the last minute and the future minute. But wait a moment, it's not only that, it's the last second and the future second. No, it's not that either. It's the last one third of a second and the future one third of a second. And you can keep on playing this game until you realize that this delusional present separate from past and future just poofs up into nothingness. Yet all the past and all the future are in it. All of reality exists in a singularity without extension outside space and time. And if you see this once, you cannot unsee this. Yes, beautifully said, beautifully said. And the, the last thing I want to mention is because I was listening to an interview you did, Bernardo, with um, what what do they call it? De Demystify Psy, a recent one. Oh, yeah. Podcast. One of the podcasts. Yeah. Podcast. De Demystify Psy. And it just it, it, it made me reflect again on the the amazing bewildering difficulty of getting this view across to to somebody who's who's has all the physicalist uh, assumptions and it's like you work you can work really hard to explain it all very very carefully and they can 
parse the words you're saying and somehow it just doesn't click. <laughs> I saw you like yeah, you explained you... everything and then the guy said a thing and you just had the smile that I know is the smile of like, oh gosh, no, this <laughs> <it> didn't work. <laughs> but it's, why? It's not you know, an arrogant smile. It's, it, no, it's I know. a smile of, of compassion and empathy. Uh, yeah. And, and I was just, there. I used wow. to be there. Yeah, exactly. And it's amazing because this is what something we should study neurologically at some point. Like, what is this thing that happens where suddenly it clicks and you get it and you're getting it from this somehow deeper than conceptual level uh, that, that before you were just uh, 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 parsing the meaning of sentences, but you weren't actually getting, grokking, some people say, what is being said and it's and it's astonishing how the the it maybe has something to do with the fact that the um cultural narrative goes way deeper than we realize it goes so deep that to, that to uproot it and and to and to offer something else in its place is a is a profoundly challenging uh uh yeah. thing, you know I, you know i mean my fifth fifth fiftieth year now uh, will be 50 um, in less than 12 months. Um, and I got to a point where I concluded that we never teach anything to anyone and nobody ever teaches anything to us. What actually happens is that people naturally evolve to a certain place in the palace of mind, to a certain comprehension of what's going on. But if they don't have the language to tell themselves what it is that they already understand, they will overtly stick to their previous position. In other words, you, you may already have moved away from materialism deep within you, under the surface, through your natural evolution. But because you don't have yet the language to tell yourself what it is that you now can see that you couldn't see before, then you only tell yourself that you're still where you were before. And that's the role we can play. We can give people that language that they can use to tell themselves what they already know. And then they realize that they know. But if they, don't, if they didn't already knew, if they didn't already know before we talked to them, there is no way that whatever we say, how compelling it might be, will actually move them to that new place. No, it only works yeah. if they're already <laughs> there. They just don't know that they are. Or, or, or they're almost there sometimes, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Beautifully said. And this explains why uh, I've gotten countless letters from people re who read, read my first book, which explains this view. Um, and they write and they say, I felt you were giving words to something I already knew deep inside, but I didn't have the words for. I, I've gotten that letter 200 times you know so that's it really proves what you're what you're saying it's it, it's wonderful to uh have this conversation sorry i have to go um and for it's been a for, pleasure uh, thank Christopher. you thank you so much thank you bernardo uh, i hope <laughs> we talk again yeah i hope we talk again it would be cool if if you and i and rupert could get together for dinner sometime or something that would be awesome um, sure. Yeah. And uh, we have a favorite uh, Italian restaurant. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Uh, last thing before I go is just that if anyone wants to learn more about this, this tradition, I study, um, you know, not that you that not that you need to. You've got Bernardo explaining everything perfectly. <laughs> but if you want to <laughs> learn wish. about it from this uh, tradition, specific tradition and the practices, the meditations that that it offers um there's there's a link i just put a link in the in the chat window you have to copy and paste it and then you can um go there and and learn what we have uh, to offer um so yeah thank you so much amir and and bernardo and everyone and uh thank you for your contribution time. really appreciate it thank you very thank you. much thank you so much yeah hope this happens again very yeah good. take care everyone bye okay. for now like, great. So also just uh, just acknowledging everyone. I also had equal to the chats. I also had my own questions pinging as quickly as questions were pinging in the chats, and obviously we didn't get to any of them. But I believe uh, Christopher does um, also online stuff. So some of the questions were quite specific to him. 
So I just encourage you to, to look him up and, and especially the ones about the traditions that he studies, you can direct him directly. And then obviously we've got uh, the rest of the evening with Bernardo and we've so far been doing this twice a year. So, you know, if Bernardo is willing, I, I certainly am and hopefully there'll be other opportunities to dive with Sure, so, uh, it's yeah. my favorite event. <laughs> Great, cool. I'm like, so happy to hear and um, keep feeding back whatever you, whatever will help it remain your favorite event, we'll be happy to accommodate. it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Look, you make this event, uh, um, I'm not sure how aware of it you are. Um, I talk to a lot of people, I go to many events. There is a reason this is my favorite event. And it's not me, <laughs> if you know what I mean, because I am, I am in all other events in which I participate. So yes, so for as long as you're willing to do this, I'm, I'm willing to do this. Great, long, long may it continue. And, um... It's English is one of those few languages that doesn't have a plural you. Um, but I, I'm interpreting what Bernard just said as the plural you, as opposed to me. It's us together. Like this, these conversations yeah, are uh, the same as just me and Bernard. Or, both or, are true. I did mean you in the singular, but I um, now that you said it, I also mean in the audience. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm convinced. Absolutely convinced of that. So, um, all right, let's. Uh, do, do you need a break, Bernard? Or no, let's go. Let's go. Do you have any reflections you want to share before we do? No, he has the same energy uh, Rupert has. And usually after a conversation with Rupert, my mind is completely empty. <laughs> and that's what I'm experiencing uh, right now. <laughs> I noticed you referred to, because he gave those three pillars, which was um, meditative insight, philosophy, and scripture. And you didn't mention the scripture, which doesn't surprise me at all, because I also, like, if he quoted scripture, I'd be like, so what? Some guy wrote some stuff down. I've got a scripture that says the opposite. Is, is there any useful thing to notice about that, that we just today, not everyone, obviously, lots of people are killing other people because of stuff it says in some Bible or holy book, but well, imagine, yeah. We have consistently made a royal mess of scripture. <laughs> so, uh Hey, if you want to join these conversations and the Q&As that follow them live, you can find us at adventuresinawareness.com, as well as courses, events, retreats, and gatherings, and join quite an amazing community of meditators, mystics, scientists, and consciousness researchers.